Insight Exposing Narcissism is sponsored by Pinch of Nom. Enjoy creamy strawberry French toast and banana bread brownies. Enjoy meatball lasagna and veggie spring rolls. Enjoy all your favourites. Pinch of Nom Enjoy is the new slimming friendly cookbook from Kay and Kate Allenson. Available now, it's packed with 100 new recipes for tasty breakfasts, bakes, roasts, fakeaways, snacks and sweet treats and more. You can buy it with the link in the show notes. Take care. Bye. Welcome to Insight with Katie McKenna and Helen Villas. Hi Katie, how's it going? I'm really good, Helen. How are you? Uh, well, it's been a little bit dramatic in my house <laughs> in the last... A little bit dramatic. So, But I'm going to share what's happened. You mm. know, I've had a little chat about this. I'm going to share what's happened just because... There's such a good model in it and such a good learning, I think, for other people from what happened. If, you know, hopefully, God, now I'm saying it. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> we, might, we might have built it up a, a bit much, but I think it was really interesting when we talked about this before around medical gaslighting and how we can mm. gaslight ourselves. And I know definitely me with the kids that I can struggle with what is the part of me being overzealous or, you know, uh, smothering when something's wrong to the point that I can actually be think no you'll be okay and struggle to when do I take them to the doctor or not and how easy it is to gaslight ourselves so it's it's on that vein so yeah throw them throw them back to what what night was it last week it was Friday night it was okay so you and I we'd had quite a stressful week with mm-hmm. the things around the, book was busy. And the podcast and the busy I think that's the under like talk about <laughs> gaslighting <laughs> Jesus <laughs> <laughs> it was uh yeah wow uh so we had quite a stressful it, week it was then... a lot and to own that there, I was I was overwhelmed with the amount of stuff that was yeah. kind of coming at us and it was busy there was a lot going hmm. on and then Friday morning you and I were recording all day we were recording workshops that are going to go live on our website soon mm-hmm. and I said to you in the morning my next feeling really bad I think it's going to go mm-hmm. at some point I need to be really careful and when I say my neck's going to go, I have had this issue with my neck for, I want to say about 15 years, 12 to 15 years, uh, where something in it pops. This is so gross. I'm sorry. If you need to forward, <laughs> by all means, crack on. Probably going to be about five minutes talking about this, maybe 10. Where something in my neck pops and it's intensely painful. I go into this spasm type thing and then it's it's just like, don't touch me, I can't move. This, da, 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 da. And you'd seen it happen. You've seen it happen twice, mm-hmm. actually. Once when I was teaching you on my workshop and then another time when I was actually at your house and I was dancing and it happened and I just scurried away like a wounded animal to like mm-hmm. try and wait for it to pass. Here's the thing about it. So this, this thing, I don't even know that is going to happen. It happens. The, the thing, the popping of the thing happens the intense pain happens and I never know what to do in that moment because I can't swallow I can't speak I can't lift my arm I'm in an intense and I mean a 10 when it comes to pain like oh my god and I'm it makes me cry it's it's horrendous and you have a really good pain threshold well I don't know you do yeah okay (laughs) see I don't I think I'm a bit of a wimp but okay so Friday night, this thing happens. The, my bless her, my little girl gave me a cuddle, and one one of the things that can make it pop is if someone hugs me and pushes their head against mine too hard, and it just goes, and there Jesus. it is. Even that, so, chuck, chuck, like something's gone. Yeah, yeah, something's happened to my neck, and my doctor's never been able to work out what it is. Yada yada. Go on. What were you going to ask? Well, I suppose, I, I think maybe to let you finish first, because when we're talking about their pressure, like your wee girl is seven. seven. And so you're, I mean, I her, but she doesn't <laughs> have that much she strength, doesn't. right? So we're talking yeah. really about how delicate this is, right? This is not something really strong and lots of pressure. There are, mm-hmm. I just have to lie flat on a bed and it can send it. If I've not got the right pillows, that can make it happen. If I just, it's, It's a horrible, horrible thing that I'm always kind of on alert to it happening. So if I don't have the correct pillow, anything, there is just literally anything that could trip it. I could just flick my hair back and it will go and Mm. it's gone. And so this happened on Friday night and I text Katie because all like, luckily my phone was right by my hand and I could type. And so I text Katie going, 
Oh, my neck's gone. And Katie goes, call 999. And I go, yeah, that's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm not calling 999. It'll go back in in a minute. Anyway, this goes on for about half an hour. And then I agreed that if it was still bad by 10 past eight or whatever it was, I would then phone 999. And then 10 past eight comes and I'm like, oh, it'll be all right. It'll go back in in a minute. Anyway, Katie convinced me by... Well, it was amazing. Do you want to tell them what you did? Because it was actually... So, and I and I didn't say a phone and ambulance first. You had said my neck's gone. And I was, no. And I think I was like, oh my God, like, that's awful. And you were like, yeah, I'm in such pain. I've had to lie down. I can't move my arm. No, no, I wasn't. And- I wasn't lying. Sorry, I wasn't lying down. I was just sat in the chair when it happened and I hadn't moved from, I can't move. I couldn't. There's no way I'd okay, be able I, to get I have to, yeah, I have to remain still. And you had said kind of in quick succession, if I, if I remember correctly, it was, I can't move my arm. I can't turn my head. It's intense pain um, when I move, but even when I don't move, it's really, really painful. I could cry. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Yeah. And so then I was like, phone an ambulance. And you were like, no, no, it's fine. It'll it'll go back in <laughs> by itself. And I was like, this is this has been ongoing for a long time. And you've never been able to get to the doctor when it's happened. Obviously, one you mm-hmm. can't drive. So I was saying, mm-hmm. yeah, phone an ambulance. And then you said to me, Google the symptoms, will you? Because I yeah, I can't, because yeah. you said it was sore to read. And I said, <laughs> I did. It said phone an ambulance. <laughs> it was, now, and then I went, don't make me laugh, you bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and I funny. then had, because then you were like, really? And then I just literally, and I just copied and pasted your message into one text. I said, imagine mm-hmm. this is me saying this to you. Something has popped from my neck and it's so painful that I can't turn my head, even lying still, like it's debilitating. I can't move my arm. I can't turn my head. Uh, I'm in intense pain. I'm crying. Like my my daughter was scared and left the room. Mm. You know, what would you say to me? And you were like, right, okay, I'll give it another few minutes and I'll and I'll phone. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So so go then. And you did actually. So I rang them Mm -hmm. and then because they're being kind, I get more upset because who hasn't got a bloody kindness wound that grows up in those environments? So they're being really lovely and I, that's just making it worse. And I'm like, just stop being nice to me and then I'll tell you what's going on. But obviously I can, can't talk. So I'm talking a bit like this, like my jaw Jeez. is wired together. Oh my so God, I didn't even know it. that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, that's, yeah, that's what it was like. And then, bless her, she said, I'm so sorry, but all the ambulances are busy on um, emergency, life-threatening things and and I almost in my head I went see Katie like <laughs> genuinely I was like see I just, <laughs> see what see I told you they wouldn't be able to do anything was mm. what like I told you I was making a fuss mm. I told you like it wasn't important enough is what I'm thinking so because there's other real people that are really unwell and really need treatment yeah yeah and then she goes but I'm going to get someone to call you back because anyway so then a paramedic rang me back and the paramedic was like you know this sounds like you've dislocated your neck and next time this happens call 999 immediately Mm. immediately don't wait this long because you know this this call came in at this point and I'm I've called you back at this point and you're still in pain and it's still like next time so bless them she bless her she was lovely and she she just said to me Absolutely. And then I said, but I just feel like I'm wasting your time. Mm. And she immediately went, absolutely not. No, you need to go. And if you can't get an ambulance, get to A&E and do this and do that, just said to me, and really, I would have you go down tonight. But given your situation with the children and this, that and the other, and the fact that I've got a lot of the medication in the house that they would give me anyway, I, it's probably okay but if it happens again I want you down there straight away mm. and it was so validating, validating Katie because it was so like oh okay so you really do care about this this is not me being ridiculous and I look at it's so the dissonance that I have between now I'm sitting here talking to you about it and like almost laughing. Oh no, I am laughing at the fact that I think I'm being ridiculous. Well, even there, what I didn't know, you're saying that I had to talk like this because I kind of, my <laughs> neck because it's popped and I didn't even know it was that bad. It hurts. It hurts to breathe. It hurts to swallow. It hurts. Poor, my poor son went and got the, because they've given me diazepam for this sort of thing. And so he went and got the medication and then he gave me a drink and he put the, 
straw to my mouth but he just put it in a bit too hard and he jolted my head and I screamed oh. and my poor my poor love anyway everyone was so focused on my lovely neighbor then came over as well to sit with them because she was freaking out she kept going are you gonna die mummy and the, and then oh, I was yeah. like okay no this is actually I need to really make sure she's okay emotionally part of it was a little bit like oh are you gonna die mummy she's very interested <laughs> about it but so my lovely neighbor came over to sit with her my son actually said to me well what about dinner then which was amazing <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and um, anyway bless him after it was all over and like it had gone back in and everything and um, my daughter was in bed asleep. My son and I were lying on my bed and everyone had been so focused on my daughter and she's seven, he's 15. And I said to him, are you all right? Mm -hmm. Was that scary for you? And he was like, mm, it doesn't matter. And I, said, and I was like, babe, was it scary for you? Mm. It's all right if it was. Well, it's over now, it doesn't matter. It does. If Was it scary for you? And he and eventually he just con conceded, well, it wasn't very nice. Mm. So, like, that was a bit of a wake up call as well, watching them in it. And because they don't really, they've never seen it, I don't think, mm. actually. I don't think they've ever seen it happen. And yeah. Anyway, the good news is I've called the doctor today. I've got, I've spoken to them, would like taste it all up. There's not a lot they're doing for me, but also next time I will call the ambulance immediately and I will go if I can to A&E. And yeah, it was an interesting thing of how strong that self gaslighting was around me making a fuss. I cannot tell you how embarrassed I was even to phone 999. Like I mm. was mortified to do it. And then they were taking it so seriously that I was like, Oh, okay. No. All right. And you taking it seriously. As well. <laughs> like, I I absolutely was. And then the next day, you know, you had messaged me and said, sorry for panicking you last night. And I said, no, I, I wasn't panicked. Like I was appropriately worried. I was appropriately concerned. You were sending me like, they're going, don't make me cry, bitch. <laughs> and, send and, laugh and, yeah. and then she afterwards, because I sent you like a, it was a, like a kind message. And you were like, you know, don't make me cry. And I was like, here, take your fucking pick. Don't make you laugh. Don't make you cry. What am I doing? <laughs> so I, like, I knew you were, you know, cognizant and that you were able to engage in conversation. But I also knew that you were absolutely neglecting yourself. And if I'm right, it was only actually when you were thinking of phoning the ambulance that you actually even reached out for your neighbor to come over. Because oh, no, it was after I'd spoken to them and they told me to call my neighbor to come okay. over. Yeah. Because had you messaged and said, oh, my neighbor's coming over, I would have been like, oh, okay, there's, there's another adult with mm. Helen that will be. Because when we are sick, we can't generally advocate for ourselves because we're, we're in such survival mode. And then if I remove it from you, Helen, and if we talk mm -hmm. about somebody growing up in a narcissistic family and either being directly or indirectly told that they're being dramatic, you know, mm -hmm. um, selfish, demanding, always creating a fuss, right? There's that wound. But there's also the one where the child is witnessing the parent do this, always want to be at the center of attention. You know, the way we talk about the narcissistic mm. parent, that if the child has a pain in the head, the, the mother has a migraine, yeah. or if the, the child fractured their arm, the father, well, they broke their arm and it was fallen off. They're always worse. If I had a cold, they had a flu, right? So it's always yeah. worse. And I think there's a huge fear then in the child in that environment. Well, I don't want to be like them. I don't want yeah. to actually be the one that's moaning and complaining and there'll be nothing wrong with me. And then added to this, well, I actually care about other people and I don't want to be taken up a spot where somebody else that's genuine and in yeah. need needs it. But here's the biggest difference. You were genuine and in need. And that is with having, again, healthy relationships. And I think had you called your neighbor your, before me and she had especially mm -hmm. seen you, mm -hmm. she would have been more adamant about this or not adamant, just saying, I think this is, I mean, I think this is a, the right thing to do. And, but yeah, I think it's those two things combined. It's so interesting, isn't it? Because there's definitely the fear of making a fuss. I don't know that I experienced, but I definitely know that my client group mm -hmm. does. And it, I then was thinking about my clients that start with me quite often within the first two or three sessions will say something along the lines of, I feel guilty for taking up your time. Mm -hmm. Someone else needs it more. Mm -hmm. And I think that's possibly what we're all relating to in that as well. There is another bit of me, which is 
and this is my experience, so, I, you know, maybe I don't know if this relates to you at all as well or anybody else listening. But the idea that the fact that I had cognitive awareness mm-hmm. meant it wasn't serious enough. So that you have to be delirious mm. to wow. use that help, right? Like, mm. yeah, that that because my brain is functioning, it doesn't matter that my body isn't. They feel disconnected to me anyway. So I know that that's one of my things. So I don't know right, if that's something that's, other people That's where I was going to go to. I was going to talk about, let's talk about the dissociation from emotional and physical pain. And actually mm. the brain experiences the two in the same part of the yeah. brain, right? Emotional and physical pain. And here, look at your ability to block out physical pain and be able to be, no, like, let you me try say and... that so confidently, like I've got this massive pain threshold. I just don't think it's true, Katie. When we had this last conversation on the podcast, this was around you talking about sharing with me oh, that um, your hand and yeah. and you would often say my, my hands, my hands sore, I won't be texting any or I won't be texting later or I'll voice note. And I just thought like, like you had a little pain in your hand and oh, like my hand sore as if, you know, I was typing all day and my hand is sore. And then it was one day you actually described to me what was happening. And I was like, whoa, this is, this is serious. This is, this is not normal. And you went to your doctor then with that. And what was it they said you had? They said, no, it was my friend said to me, the thing that triggered it all was my friend said when my, when her friend had been diagnosed with arthritis and I was like, wait, what? Mm. (laughs) And then, and then, I mean, it's all hypermobility stuff. And, and I think my neck is too, actually, but repetitive strain. I, I don't know. I don't know. Cause I never got x-rays on my hands. So it could possibly be mm. the start of arthritis too. So, so the, the pain is valid. Like, that's my point that the pain is valid, but you would minimize that even there were you only sharing that with your neck and I, and I can't talk. Like it was like my jaw was wired shut and mm. it was just as we were talking in the, in the WhatsApp, the messages going back and forth. I was hearing more and I also knew in what I was hearing that there was a really good chance that you were also minimizing it a bit um so I was going <laughs> if this is what I'm <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking if this is what I'm hearing well yeah you would I mean if that was one of your kids that had 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 that experience what would you do with them I'd like to think I would call 999 I mm. I, I also really struggle like you with the I do. boundary so of the it. Hair, I remember when and I had shared the story that my daughter had uh, the basketball had banged up on her finger the day before and it was bruised underneath and then the next day I had taken her to the mm. to the hospital yeah and I, so I messaged you and I said it's it's broke and you had said, you know, this was not your fault. And I was like, oh, I'm not in any way setting in, in self-blame. I get this was an accent I didn't know. And I'm just relieved that I didn't miss the glad doctor's time. In a way. Yeah, yes. I wasn't glad that she yeah. broke it. But I was actually glad that I could trust myself. Oh, this actually warranted coming out. Mm. So I'm glad that I trusted myself to go because I was still debating going, oh, am I one of, quote unquote, those mothers, right? Oh, am I oh. being, a, yeah, am I being a hypochondriac? Am I being... Uh, too much like am I you know what's the part where let them heal yeah. you know we we yeah. were very much you know whenever we were anyway sick or unwell lie up on the couch with a glass of flat seven up and right. that was and see to get the couch there were six kids and to actually get to lie on the couch and wow. have the you were allowed to lie like with your feet up and <laughs> get Luxury. the flat seven up and yeah. so like when that is the the base of of care and then it's like okay well when when do I when do I go to the doctor? What's the point where your body needs to fight this itself and you need to kind of get through it? And then what's the point actually that we need medical intervention? And I'm I'm better at seeing it for other people. So see, they're seeing it for you. I'm well able mm. to see that. And for for my kids, I'm definitely getting better and I'm better at kind of erring on the side of caution that actually mm-hmm. if I'm thinking, God, could that be broke? If I'm actually thinking that there's something wrong. <laughs> Right. Right. Because I don't think I haven't thought of that for the other 364 days in the year. It's never crossed my mind once. (laughs) Is her her finger broke? Right. So if I'm starting to question going, I wonder, is it broke? Well, then there's a there's a validity there. And I mean, I've only ever taken her for a break once. And it was I know she actually went twice. One was broke. One wasn't. My son, he had a fracture. It was fractured. And my other son, the same. And But I really struggle and debate. And I mean, there, like my eldest is 11, the handful of times, and it is only a handful of times, that they ended up going out for broken bones. And four of them was right out of five. So 
with those sort of statistics, I, I shouldn't doubt myself and I'm getting, mm. I'm getting better at not doing that. Um, but I also know that it's a, still a, a hurdle for me to cross. It's a funny and my one, husband isn't, isn't. He's 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 good at calling it. You know, is he? Oh yeah, yeah. He's is good it, at yeah. go, go get them. Yeah, go get them checked out. Yeah, let's take them. I just as you were talking then, and you were talking about the sort of statistics, and it's like I suddenly thought, but that's why they triage. That's mm. why they go and like put you through a system before they put you in an X-ray. Because oh, true. They, Right, and that's because if the, they don't think you need an X-ray, yeah, you would be. Give it. I never even thought of that. No, it's yeah. just why that just occurred to me as well. So yeah, like yeah. that's why they triage us, because mm. then they want to make sure that you actually need the radiation. Is yeah. what it is. They don't want to give you unnecessary radiation, mm-hmm. so they make sure that you really do have to need it. Like it's really interesting that we we're sitting here trying to make medical decisions as non-medical people. Yeah. And it's absolutely bloody because that's what they did to me on the 999 call was triaged me. Mm-hmm. She asked me, you know, can you breathe? Can you is your like she was t- checking for heart attack essentially. And um and I said no no everything's you know all that's fine. Just like I can't move and my blah, 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 and, <laughs> and my neck spasms every time I do anything slightly and she triaged me she knew my life wasn't in danger but she Mm -hmm. validated my pain and then said I'm going to get someone to call you back and then their response was to say well everything I would do for you you've already done for yourself Mm. and so there's no nothing I can offer you and what she was talking about was the medication that I'd had to take and and then was just like get back to a GP or go to out of hours she was so it's interesting that we are trying to do a job that neither of us are trained to do, mm. which is triage our children as to whether or not they need medical. And we've both gone to the extreme as to broken or not broken, rather than <laughs> yeah, <laughs> does it need checking? Yeah, what's like? Yeah, if something still needs strapped or if it's sore. And here, look at me being able to say that for you. And I had shared on the podcast where my arm had been so sore, my forearm. And actually it was all linked up to my neck, which I didn't even realize. I had told her, no, my neck, my neck and shoulder isn't sore at all, which was how much I was just used to carrying it. And it was only down to the point, actually, when I was lifting a cup of tea that it was sore because I'd already compensated. I wouldn't lift my handbag with my right hand. I wasn't lifting the kettle with my right hand. I wasn't doing any of that. But actually, when I was coming down to Jesus, this is sore when I'm lifting a cup of tea. And it was only I was talking to one of my friends and they were like, you need to go and see a physio. And I was like, what? For Because I was like, it's this, it's just like a muscle in my forearm. And they were like, yeah, that's actually what, what they would treat. And I was like, seriously. Now, in my defense, I had been in the doctors a couple of months before with tonsillitis. Yeah. And I'd said to them and he, he thought, oh, no, could it be tennis elbow? No, it's not. But as soon as I went into the physio and was validated and she was like, is your, is your neck and shoulder sore? And I was like, no, not at all. And then she went this and I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> I was like, that's really sore. And she was like, yeah, like, how have you been managing this pain? And I was going, no. And she was like, like, what are you taking? And I was like, no, nothing. <laughs> I was like, I'm, <laughs> I'm fine. So, you know, and then having somebody going, God, no, you, you should go back into the doctors and be like, be put on something for, you know, this course of treatment. And, I, and then I was going, oh, here, I'll be going with a couple of uh, paracetamol or neurofen. So it's just how easy we can gaslight ourselves and for me it's absolutely to not want to be that person that's moaning or complaining to not want to be that hypochondriac to not it's behavior that yeah it it really grates on me when I see somebody else constantly always what do you call it black hatting my yeah, my cat's black than yours yeah. 11 or eight. and yeah I never want to be that person but there's the point where we can just ignore ourselves and make ourselves invisible whereas like, yeah we need yeah. to mind ourselves because that's the fear of the shame right mm. because we're so scared of being shameful people judging us making us you know thinking that we're terrible because we are telling them about our illness or seeking care for ourselves Mm. right so one of the narratives I had growing up was that I was a hypochondriac and it was because I had undiagnosed hypermobility syndrome so I was in a lot of pain growing up and I should have been getting medical attention but I wasn't getting it Mm -hmm. and and so I was constantly told that I was complaining about nothing that I was moaning and yeah I was a hypochondriac so oh, here we go Helen like you know and the fear of feeling that judgment mm. from anyone else right and the other side of it is here I am asking for care and the chances that they could reject that 
And what's that going to make me feel too? So there's yeah. so much inner child work in all of this. So if you're listening to this little ramble about <laughs> medical gaslight, self-gaslighting and relating to it, don't just look at the place of the medical self-gaslighting. Look at where else it's happening. Where else you say, I won't ask for my need to be met because if I do, it will make me a terrible person. Someone's going to shame me. I'm going to be a dread, you know, outcast. And I just want you to notice it for yourself so and yeah. there that emotion that you had said because what would that make me feel and the emotion of shame so we shame. will do anything then to avoid the shame whereas when we bring this to light the shame shifts the shame moves shame thrives in darkness and darkness and secrecy and it's actually when it's met with compassion understanding empathy it it shifts shame can't survive in the light yeah absolutely and with that katie is going to be grief because mm. when we start noticing where shame was used against us, weaponized against us, and then we sit with this toxic shame of, I'm a terrible person if I ask for a need to be met, then we're going to move into the grief of how I feel about the fact that that was placed upon me. Mm -hmm. And grief, grief is the thing we also try very hard to avoid too. Absolutely, Helen. And I actually think that's a great segue into this week's letter. I absolutely agree. So here we go. Dear Katie and Helen, thank you so much for your podcasts. They have helped me feel validated and not alone. I know my past was bad, but I have cycles of questioning if my present is really that bad. I'd be grateful for your perspective on how the past and present are related. I grew up as a family of four with my mum being an extremely loving mum and my dad was around. To the outside world, we were a perfect family until my mum suddenly announced that she wanted a divorce, sending my dad a solicitor's letter to all of our surprise. My parents had an extremely messy divorce whilst all living in the same house for long periods of it, although my mum was frequently abroad with work. I was parentified emotionally by becoming my dad's closest friend and listening to all his issues. He told me things that were extremely inappropriate as his daughter, such as the details of his sex life and traumatic events. Once I asked him why the telephone cable in his bedroom was cut, he explained that he wanted to punish my mum, so he had locked them both in his bedroom, cut the telephone and then took a mixture of medicines so that my mum had to watch him die. There was never any consideration of the impact of telling me things like this. I was also parentified when it came to housework. I took on a significant amount of chores that my mum had done. If I didn't do certain things like cooking, we wouldn't have cooked a meal. My younger brother and I didn't have food in for lunches and weren't given money to buy lunches. I felt like we were neglected and didn't have a parent figure. My dad would love bomb new girlfriends and they became his everything. From going on holidays during term times, leaving my brother and I alone, to saying he would give me a lift somewhere at a certain time, but leaving me downstairs waiting whilst I could hear him upstairs having sex. I look back at it now and feel like I was never a priority and I was always seen to be okay and therefore didn't need parenting or love. I feel angry and so sad as I reflect on how I struggled alone and in silence during this time. My days would involve going to school, coming home to walk the dog, cook tea, clean, listen to my dad for hours about his issues, go to bed late and cry by myself alone. At 16, I applied for a sixth form boarding college. I was successful and it was my escape, but holidays meant I came home to my dad. He had married a Russian woman he had met on the internet and proposed to her the first time they met. She was horrible to me. I would be sat watching TV and she would walk into the room and scream at me. My dad told me later it was because I hadn't stood up when she walked into the room. He didn't stand up for me or protect me from her. He would often tell me that she had given up her children to come to the UK and she wanted him to do the same, as if I should be empathetic to her. I endured these times knowing that the end goal was a career which would allow me to be independent. These are only a small number of examples of awful things I experienced as a teenager and young adult, but somehow my dad has always portrayed this image that we were really close and that he was a great dad. I feel like the impact of his actions are so invisible to him. I've never told him that I've been hurt and how I feel. I don't feel like I'm allowed to. Recently, I told my dad that I was going to get some counselling and he told me that he couldn't cope with the idea that I might have any issues. I struggle now with pretending we are a happy family and I have built up so much frustration and hurt after spending time together. What he says and does triggers me all the time and I feel like I have to recover from visits where he just gets to enjoy playing head of this loving family. 
As a parent now, I reflect on how he is with my children and what he was like when I was young, and I have less empathy for him. I'm very protective of my children around him, and I feel like I'm hovering around him to correct him, from demanding a kiss from the child and me being their voice and saying they're allowed to not kiss him. I don't have my own voice yet with him, but I do for my children and I know this annoys him. He criticises me for being too good a mum and says that what I do is unachievable, which sounds like him projecting his own guilt or failures onto me. But instead of offering help when I'm tired, I'm criticised for how I want to parent. Despite all this, I feel so much expectation to see him all the time and let him be this great grandparent. For example, he's built a treehouse in his garden so that I visit more with the children. My granddad died recently, but when I last saw him, he told me that my dad was such a great granddad. It has stuck with me, and I wonder why he thinks that. When my youngest was born, I had a home birth, and my dad looked after my eldest for a few hours. He brought him home before I even had time to shower. When he arrived, it was all about how his wife was such a great grandma and how she had to hold the baby. Six hours after giving birth, I was the one loading the dishwasher and cleaning up. My husband was equally busy hosting and looking after my eldest. My dad asked me how long I wanted him to stay and help. I don't understand how he can think he's this amazing, helpful dad when his actions are so different. But I'm left with the guilt of not seeing him more. It's like I'm the difficult one, even the cruel one when I don't visit more or let them look after both children alone. How is everything that he's done in the past so invisible? How can he say such things to me as, if I had my time again, I wouldn't have children, and expect us to play happy family? I can't think of examples, but the way he talks is always giving this image that he helps others so much and he's so loving and caring. So I'm left feeling like I'm the mean one for creating space. The only way I know to reduce me being triggered and upset by him. I can't talk to him about the past, and yet my present is so affected by it. I've been doing therapy for almost a year now and I feel stronger to be myself and prioritise myself. As a result, I just want to slip away from my dad but without causing conflict or being the source of his complaining. How can my past experiences be so ignored and invalid? I really struggle with pretending that everything is just great with my dad and I want to create distance without having the conflict or having to justify why I feel how I do. But whenever I take steps to do this, I feel guilty and as if I'm being mean to my dad. I feel really like I go through cycles of it feeling valid that he has been so horrible to me and I need space to prioritise myself. And then I feel guilty and like I'm the one who is being unkind and thinking that he's not that bad now and I'm making things a bigger deal. Is it possible to have some form of relationship without addressing the issues of the past and tolerating the present, knowing he doesn't have the same impact on me now I'm independent? Why do I feel like it's so hard to limit contact when I feel like I don't get anything from the relationship? I don't think he'll ever change who he is, so I don't think it's hope that I'm holding on to. I think I've spent my childhood being told he's a great dad, with his actions being different, that I don't trust my feelings around it. Why do I battle with these mixed feelings? Is this what a narcissist does? I'd be grateful for your thoughts on if it's realistic to think that without addressing the past, is it possible to have an okay relationship in the present and the future? Or does it sound like my dad is always going to be a source of pain, even if I'm the only one who sees it? It's here. You're Not the Problem is now available to pre-order. Links are in the show notes. And if you order now, you lock in the price and won't pay a penny until dispatch day. Wow, Helen. The empathy I feel for this listener just having been so invisible in her father's eyes, him always prioritizing himself. And he's absolutely doing that with the emotional parentification, guilting her from childhood that his needs come first, his priorities, his drama, whatever's happening in his life. But to the detriment of this listener. And when somebody grows up in an environment like this, where they're not being validated, where they're being ignored, where they're being treated as if they're invisible, we can see why now it sounds like this listener is absolutely gaslighting herself. It sounds like through the therapy that she's in and she's able to recognize now her healthy anger when she's in a conversation or her father does something. And then when she goes away from that, where the guilt is arising, it sounds like she's gaslighting herself going, God, was it really that bad? Yeah. What, does it really warrant me being annoyed? Am I being mean? Am I being selfish? Do I need to prioritize my father? Because this is what I've been conditioned to do all my life. 
I mean, isn't that what we hear all the time? Mm. Fear, obligation, guilt. I feel guilty because I'm obliged to prioritize him in my thinking, his needs, his wants, his desires. But let's go back to the beginning of this letter because absolutely, there's something else, Katie, that really struck me. Mum is completely absent. Mm. Where is she? And it said at the beginning, um, I grew up as a family of four with my mum being an extremely loving mum and dad was around. And to the outside world, we were a perfect family until mum decided she wanted a divorce. So there was this very brief mention of mum and then that was it. And I, I'm wondering about, not apart from anything else, the divide of, of whether or not mum was, uh, sorry, listener was going to mum's house or if it was like how custody was split. Just noticing where mum's support was even, because there's something really difficult in this um, about where were you getting some external kind of support if you were. So, yeah, he was making her his confidant, his therapist, his he was fostering this dependency and being completely inappropriate with her around his adult relationships, his kind of experience of his own trauma, and then to tell her that he had cut the telephone cord in the bedroom to punish her mother so that mum would see him die of an overdose and be completely powerless to do anything about it. The the layers of trauma in that are horrific. And I'm just sitting with the trauma of holding that. And we don't know how old this uh, listener was at this point because we don't have an age kind of stamp on it. But regardless, it would be inappropriate. It doesn't matter what age. To hear your father talk about that and tell you that, that is absolutely inappropriate. So just the trauma of that alone, we can see this intrusion constantly and dad prioritizing himself constantly. And so then we go to the last question and it's, yeah, dad is absolutely, he has conditioned you to prioritize his thoughts, feelings and needs above your own all the time. And then not to do so makes you a bad person. It also shows the father's lie up here in a really big way, right? When he is presenting and saying to our listener here, saying that, I, you know, it was such a loving childhood and I'm such a loving father. He's doing the exact same with the listener's mother, with his wife, because this listener saying that it was to all our surprise that she sent a, a divorce letter, a solicitor's letter. Whereas that is not surprising mm -hmm. when you're talking about that here, he had cut the telephone line. And as you said, yes. was was threatening her to take take his own life because she had to witness. That is abusive in such a, a violent way. That is horrific that he wanted to do this on somebody. And then to say, yeah, I was so surprised she sent me a solicitor's letter. Like the lie in that, the image that he is in a loving relationship with her and surprised to get the solicitor's letter, that's highlighting here his lie, his fabrication, the image that he is presenting. And it is the same image that he is presenting to his daughter that I am such a loving father. Well, the only thing I would say is we don't actually know when that happened with the telephone cable. It doesn't say if it was during the divorce or before the divorce was filed. But either way, it doesn't matter. And the reason it doesn't matter is because that is a, a not a first offence. Like that's, a, I say offence because it is offence yes. to, to hold someone hostage, to threaten suicide, to, to take away their free will. That is imprisoning somebody. That's absolutely illegal. And so this is not the first time this is an escalation. Somebody doesn't do that on the first time that they are being abusive. And it is abusive. You're right to call it abuse because it absolutely is. And so, yeah, you're right. This, this lie, this fabrication of this image, you know, I'm this great grandfather because I've mm -hmm. built this tree house in. But here's the kicker for me built the treehouse in my garden so they have to come to my house not in their home where they would actually be able to use it mm. all the time it's in his garden as a hoovering behavior we want to go to granddad's and play in the treehouse and all of a sudden he's this great granddad no if i if my children have children and their children want a treehouse and i can do it they're going to get it in their garden well i mean if i can do one in mine too brilliant but i'm not doing it 
to use it as a like I just have images of the Pied Piper or the you know the rat catcher in Mary mm. Poppins what's it film it's not Mary Poppins Chitty Chitty Bang Bang you know with a child catcher in yes um, yeah and he's like come out come out and he's all creepy and horrible I had nightmares about him for years mm. I'm sure we've spoken about him before but here's this thing of look at me I'm this wonderful I've got sweeties for you children and here come to me because I'm so kind and lovely and ha ha I've got you I'm trapped you're trapped now you're mine now and this is what this dad is feeling I feel very brutal saying that but this is what it's feeling like to me this entrapment of this image of we are amazing but well where Let's, oh, well, I'm, I'm ready to come on to the new wife Katie but I'm, I'm not going to yet because wow <laughs> yeah no because I, I think the incongruence here with, with what's happening right so let's go back to that image that he has of, of building the treehouse in the garden but yet when the listener says when my youngest was born I had a home birth and dad looked after my eldest for a few hours yes. he brought him home before I even had time to shower when he arrived it was all about how his wife was such a great grandma and how she had to hold the baby Six hours given birth, I was the one loading the dishwasher. So again, here's this image that he's wonderful. And then even he's coming over to the house and saying that the grandma, his his wife is wonderful. But yet he's not actually doing anything practical to be supportive. It ends up this listener then hosting her father at the house. Mm. So again, mm. when we look at this, we can see where the confusion is, where this listener is questioning herself, is gaslighting herself. Because on the one hand, oh, he's building this wonderful treehouse in, in his garden. Is that not a wonderful thing to do? But yet here he can't wait to get rid of the child quick enough. The confusion here, he wants people to come over and play in his mm -hmm. in his garden. But yet, really, if he's ever asked to mind the kids, he can't get rid of them quick enough. So again, then we have to question the motives for building the treehouse and say, well, where is the gain in this for him? And the gain is, is that it's creating this image, that it's creating mm -hmm. this illusion that he's a wonderful grandparent. So he can say this or anybody that comes to the house, they can witness this. Whereas mm -hmm. actually on the ground in real time, practically, this man is of absolute no support. In fact, he is draining her of her resources six hours after giving birth and she's there loading the dishwasher and cleaning up after him. And so at a bare minimum, he is being unhelpful. But then when we go back to actually again to childhood to look how damaging he is, he is upstairs having sex with his girlfriends while his child is downstairs going for a lift somewhere. Wait, and she's standing there. I mean, to paint that image a child downstairs waiting for a lift to go somewhere, hearing her father have sex upstairs, right? Being able to, I know. So for anybody that's watch, not watching this on YouTube, like Helen there is just I'm cringing. Grimacing. Yeah, in, in disgust. And that mm -hmm. shame belongs to the father, that he is up there having a great time and not caring of the impact of his daughter. One not caring even on a very practical level where she has to go. I mean, mm -hmm. me with four kids, I'm like, oh, who has to be where, right? I'm thinking and planning. Mm -hmm. Never mind subjecting what this man is doing, subjecting the kids to listen to him fulfill his own sexual desires, his own sexual gratification. Like it, it's absolutely, it's disgusting. There's a part of me Katie that's wondering how intentional it is too in that oh. covert sexual abuse thing I think um I know it's utterly revolting it is because that just takes it to a whole uh, a whole nother level right this is where we go back with the intent isn't it like that well it, yeah it's the, mm. you look at the emotional incest right there's this emotional incest of him wanting all her emotional attention and then does it cross that line? I don't know. I, I don't actually know feel often. sick as you said that. Like I'm, I'm, sorry. I'm actually, no, no, you have nothing to apologize for. I'm just noticing, like when we talk about kind of body work, somatic work, when we're talking about transference and just noticing this just sick feeling and, and being mm. repulsed and then want to expel it. Because here, when you're actually putting that together and recognizing the, his daughter that he was treating like a substitute spouse in mm. every way, emotionally and instrumentally. Here she is cooking, cleaning, substituting the role of the mother. And here to think that then he, when he has that replacement, that he is in a way when you're, that he is in any way then doing this intentionally. I think what's awful about it, Katie, is that this is not unusual in these family systems. Um, I've heard, I don't know about you, but in my clinical work, I, I've heard this a number of times where parents will leave the door open intentionally. They will bring um, 
other partners home and and allow their children to overhear them having sex and there's something about a power dominance control thing in it i don't know what the psychology of it is particularly other than listen to my dominance my sexuality this part of my life that you don't have access to but i'm forcing you to you don't want it either but i'm going to force you into being aware of it and it's it's well, that covert sexual revolting. abuse isn't it I mean, it is because it's intruding on a child's sexual development and that's what covert sexual abuse is. Mm -hmm. For those that don't know, this is what we're talking about. When we're talking about covert sexual abuse, we're talking about the um, intrusion on your sexual development. So wanting to know about your body, its changes, you know, wanting to touch parts of your body that are usually sexual erogenous zones. And the other part of covert sexual abuse is the... um, either intruding on your privacy, as in walking in when you're in the shower, um, or discussing masturbation on a very personal level. It's one thing to sort of talk to you about keeping things clean and healthy and everything else and normalizing it. And it's another thing to be sort of asking you how many times a week you're doing it or whatever. It's it's uh, it's intruding, intruding on your sexual privacy. It's also things like ho- hugging you for too long, and and maybe the hand is going down onto a bum or or it's um oh i've seen it all before and dismissing your need for privacy your sexual growth it's just invasion or in total invasion of your sexual development and i think it's something that i really want more people to be aware of because it's so damaging and i think what it then does is as adults gives us such a terrible relationship with sex because it feels shaming. First of all, it feels icky. It does. It feels like it belongs to them. And it feels because we respond with shame when they're in, investigating or intruding in that way, we then start associating our bodies with that shame. And so then when we start experiencing sexual pleasure, as we are meant to do as human mm-hmm. beings, we start feeling shame with it and it's a very confusing, very difficult thing. And it, it makes sex more about shame than it is about play. And it's just a very, very difficult thing. Just our sexuality, not just sex, but sexuality, our, our, um, just our physicality and our sexual being, you know, our sexual identity, everything. So covert sexual abuse. Yeah, absolutely. Wonder if this is intentional it impacts so much of a child's development. And again, when you're talking about that intent, here he is directly telling her. He told me things that were extremely inappropriate as his daughter, such as the details of his sex life and traumatic events. So here he's actually been verbally Mm. explicit explicit when he's telling her. And Helen, when you use that word intrusion, again, I just have this visual image that if somebody is intruding upon something, if somebody intrudes in my house, they're there when I don't want them to be there. And then if if something, you know, if I'm having a party or having a fun event and somebody is intruding, the focus then is on them and they're really killing the atmosphere or the mood of whatever's happening. And so that's just a really uh, kind of image when you're talking about then when it comes to sex. That here, when a child starts to healthily, like you said, explore their body or be interested in whatever, whether it's the same sex or opposite sex, and they're starting to wonder about kissing them, touching them, going on a date Mm -hmm. with them, being admired by them. But here at such a young age, if your parent intrudes on you in such a way in your early formation of sexual thoughts or even later on at any stage, but especially in the early stages of your sexual formation. It's such an intrusion, not only then, but impacts them for the rest of their lives and can have such and impact them sexually, being able to get in touch with their own sexuality, express their own sexuality, Mm. enjoy their own sexual encounters and not be mired in shame from it. Yeah, I mean, it's devastating, absolutely devastating. And and you're right, we've seen that this father is overstepping that even without the hearing him upstairs having Mm -hmm. sex. He's overstepping that all the time. But again, what this evidence is, is his needs being more important than anyone else's. You know, you said about like, we have four kids, you've got to think about who needs to be where all the time. Mm -hmm. And he's, this man has got two and he's, he's going off and having sex. But then, okay, let's go to our, our listener manages to get a scholarship. I just also want to acknowledge and validate how brilliant that is Mm. to get, a boarding scholarship to a, a a school in your sixth form just shows 
like the te- like your determination and your your mind and your anyway I just wanted to congratulate you on it actually because that's no mean feat you've did that you put yeah, yourself absolutely in, have. into that situation and you looked after yourself so I, I at 16 so here you are at 16 you've got yourself into this boarding college to get away from it to escape and what a brilliant thing to do what I mean the fact at 16 that you just thought of that even is is mm. beyond my I can just think that's amazing and meanwhile he marries a Russian woman he had met on the internet and proposed to the first time they met. So here's this woman. I mean, this also shows his um, regulation, his emotional maturity, his boundaries, his healthiness, that he's met somebody on the internet. And I'm talking to like my best friend that I spoke on, I've met on the internet and now like go to her house and run to me. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, but, you didn't propose then the, the no, first wait, time you right. met. Right, to me, this sounds very rushed, very hurried. I know, I was being slightly facetious. Yes. Know, you know, but, but it's the... He met this Russian woman on the internet and proposes to her the first time they meet, which is ridiculous. Katie's never done internet dating. I have. <laughs> you don't propose to someone on the first date. Like it's unless pre- like <laughs> unless, unless you're love bombing them and trying to entrap them. Well, yeah, but also you know, well, and not thinking about any of your priorities, any of your responsibilities, not considering anybody else in your life other mm-hmm. than yourself now if you as an individual are single with no children no responsibilities and you want to go off and marry somebody you met yesterday crack on but when that has a ripple effect on everyone around you particularly children mm-hmm. that is not okay you know that's really not i mean beyond not okay it's it's actually completely irresponsible and it's very neglectful and borderline abusive on its own. Then she was horrible to me. I would be sat watching TV and she would walk into the room and scream at me. My dad told me later that it was because I hadn't stood up when she walked into the room in our listener's home with her father. So this woman is her stepmother and is screaming abuse at the listener because she didn't stand up when the Russian woman walked into the uh, the room. Now, I just want to point out the fact that she's Russian has nothing to do with this. We're mm-hmm. not trying to cast that expression. We're just saying that, and I wondered then again, first of all, what language was it she being screamed at in? Second of all, is dad telling the truth? Is there something else that she was saying or angry about that listener isn't aware? The The fact that that was being allowed to happen and then... She was being guilted by, he would often tell me that she had given up her children to come to the UK and she wanted him to do the same. So she needs to keep quiet, comply, keep silent, keep her sweet. Otherwise, she might be out of her home too. And it is utterly revolting, like utterly disgusting and so, so abusive. Again, the messaging in this is so confusing, right? Because one... If he loved, if her father loved this Russian woman, to put her in that much pain, to not to not allow her to take the kids. And when I say allow, like that's a ridiculous word, right? To no, not no, want not include, the woman that you love to include the children to come, right? So she's been guilted with this message that she had to give up her children to come here. The husband, the father, her father would not encourage the person to be happy. Again, look how selfish and self-centered this is. And I'm wondering what sort of um, transaction happened in order Mm -hmm. for the woman, Mm -hmm. what sort of situation she was in. And this woman in possibly dire circumstances. And there's Mm -hmm. nothing in this letter that actually says that other than the bit that she gave up her children to come here as if that I'm coming kind of for a new life, a better life. But then again, right, as if that's not fucked up enough, then he's telling her to do the same. 
So on the one hand, it's showing actually this poor woman had to give up her children. But now it's actually this callous woman that's telling the husband, well, you have to do the same. There's such fuckery. There's such lies. And I'm absolutely agreeing with you. What is what is the truth? What has been not said? But the confusion again to see why this listener would end up doubting herself and gaslighting herself again when the image that he's portraying is that we were really close and he was a great dad. Right. So here we've got this message of I'm the best dad ever. Like he keeps telling her I'm the best dad I'm the best dad I'm the best dad and then he's doing all so all the evidence is wrong so we're talking about cognitive dissonance in Mm -hmm. this right the facts show that he's actually irresponsible neglectful abusive but the messaging and the want of belief is that he's a good dad Mm -hmm. so of course our listener is confused of course she is like it's Super confusing. And so, yeah, I'm just coming back to that. You know, this idea that she had to give up her children to come to the UK. Mm. And that he, she wanted him to do the same feels like a threat to me. Yeah. That doesn't feel genuine. I don't know if that's, um, I don't know what's going on there, but there's something more about that. There's, you know, I think, Look, I'm making assumptions now, but I'm thinking about the mail order bride sort of scenario that used to happen. I don't know Mm. if it still does. Um, I think it possibly does still happen. But I'm wondering if that, when you're talking about transaction, if that's what you mean, that there's been some kind of exchange that she wants this life and she's given up her children. Because you're right. If I I met someone as a single Mm. parent, right, and they said, and actually I have dumped somebody because of this, they said they didn't want my children or to be around my children too much or they don't want, you know, the role of dad. Now, I'm not asking you to be a father to my children or or anything else to them, whatever gender you might be. But what, like, I am not going to sit here and allow you to ask me to exclude my children. My children, mm-hmm. I told you the other day, my children are first. Mm. They're, they're above everyone and everything else. They will always be considered the most important thing. So if I met someone who then said, I don't want to be a parent, I would just be like, bye. That's a non-negotiable. I don't oh. even care if that hurts me. It doesn't matter if I'm in love with them. It doesn't matter how much I want that life. If you don't want my children, actually what you're telling me is you only want part of me. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to be with somebody who's doing that. Right. So there's there's that part of it. So the idea that either of these people could sacrifice their children to be with each other especially having only met on the internet and not like built like it just is revolting and yeah I'm just hearing the threat in it behave or I'm gonna I'm gonna do what she did and I'll Mm. get rid of you and so again of course she's confused like you said of course she is because she's constantly being told I'm gonna withdraw my love at any second but also I want your love all the time. And if you're not giving me all your love, that makes you a terrible person. There's there's just such fuckery, as you say. It is, and such manipulation. Recently, I told my dad I was going to get some counselling and he told me that he couldn't cope with the idea that I might have any issues. I mean, Look at the level that? of, right, for the moment there, we might think that that's pedestaling, right? That you have to be perfect in order to be around me I couldn't cope whereas really it's just it's him centering himself as a priority and him saying I I don't want to deal with this like he is literally telling you that he doesn't want to hear any of this I can't cope so do not tell me about that whereas again any parent listening or anybody that in any relationship whether that's friendship platonic or romantic if something is going on with your significant other or with a friend or especially your child because that is your responsibility for that child that they are struggling that they have issues I mean the first thing I'm going to say is tell me about it Bring that to me. You can talk to me. Helen, we've talked before about, you know, you letting your your son know, well, especially because, you know, he's the eldest that he can phone at any time. I talked Mm -hmm. about like this, you know, a safe circle with my kids. I want you to know that you can come to me. Whereas here he's saying, I couldn't cope with the idea if there's anything wrong with you. That is so silencing. He is just shutting you up right there. Well, so I agree with you, but I also think it's bigger. And Mm. I do, I've read that a little bit differently and I'm intrigued to know whether you Mm -hmm. agree with this. For me, this is about the impaired self-awareness because what I'm hearing is 
if you've got issues, I know they're my fault and I don't want you to look at them because I don't want you to hold me accountable. Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think you've just unlocked something for me. Oh, ooh. yeah. God, would you, do you want to share or do you want to not share? I, I suppose just how... This is the awareness piece, right? We we talk about before and you mm. always talk about this with the impaired self-awareness, how mm. they're aware of what they're doing. Mm. And I do see that, but they're what I'm calling manipulation, which is manipulative because it is motivational empathy, but it is because it is with that intent to avoid that responsibility and accountability. Yeah. So it is. Yeah. yeah. I just never, I just never saw it in, in, in this part. I, I never saw that. Yeah, that's huge. I I, just expand for me what, what you mean in this part. Just when the narcissist would really center themselves, that entitlement that it's all about me and I couldn't manage if you weren't able to do this thing. I just never mm. saw the impaired self-awareness there in terms of intent, that it was intentful oh, okay, to avoid yeah. the responsibility and accountability, mm. that part, that it was to avoid yeah. that. I just thought so it was what... out of entitlement and motivational empathy to center themselves and to always have themselves as the most important person. Yeah, so it's all about that, but mm. it's also yeah. about if you start picking at this thread, if you start pulling at this thread, it it could all unravel mm. and you will expose my behaviour and I'll be unable to deny it. Because oh, it's especially... so fucking manipulative, isn't it? It is. Yeah. I just can't I just can't fathom that as a as a parent. It's just like this I always say like I understand this behaviour, but I just still <laughs> it, it, like in my heart I just there's I just struggle with it I just don't, I then I don't understand it do you know like we had a thing last week with somebody blocking us quite mm. suddenly and both of us being really shocked by it mm. and then when I went and spoke to somebody else who's a psychologist and I said and can you believe this happened and we did this and this thing and then they blocked us and they he said are you really shocked and I was mm. like yeah, I am. And then he was like, no, are you really shocked? And then I was like, oh, well, I mean, yeah, but he, but what they were saying to me was, you knew that this was the outcome. You knew that this was the prediction. You knew that this would happen. You just weren't allowing yourself to believe it of that person. Helen, when we're sitting with the transference, I'm just going to jump and not to negate what you said. You just unlocked okay. something there, right? Because I think there's something in the transference here with the gaslighting that mm. I actually don't want to believe how manipulative this father is being. When I was saying you've unlocked something for me there, because I was trying to pinpoint it to my life and it actually doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. It, I think it is very much in this listener's letter and is actually sitting with what she's sitting with that actually... Not just the image of here is what this father is portraying, right? Because I can absolutely see through that, but actually to see the level of intent that is there, mm -hmm. the level of neglect that is there. Because as mm -hmm. you're saying there, am I surprised? No. And in these letters, how I'm, I'm not surprised. And we say that very well. We try to be as gentle as possible saying this is typical of what we would see. And yet with this, I'm really struggling on something that that mightn't seem such a massive thing but all the other things that he did and I'm struggling with the intent behind that he's saying that he couldn't cope with the idea that she might have any issues and when I'm saying it like that I'm like how the fuck could I not see that that actually this was just all to avoid that accountability and to stay in denial I mean it's so hard to absorb and process that anyone could actually behave in this way because it's so contradictory to how anyone who is not like these people would behave like it just isn't this do you know what I mean it's and we can see the intent though and we can see the awareness even in him criticizing her as a good mum because mm. he's saying when you're being a good mum you're you're showing up what I was when you're not neglecting your child you're showing up that I did neglect you every time you do something different to me as a parent you are shaming me and instead of saying, and here's the externalization behavior. So this is externalization is something that we see um, in narcissistic personality disorder, borderline personality disorder. Like it's a common defense mechanism, not exclusive to either of those two. It's, it's something people will do. It's a learned behavior too. So just be kind to yourself if this is something that you recognize in your own behavior. But externalizing behavior is the 
I have to put it all on you to avoid my own responsibility. So that is, I blame everyone else for my own situation. Well, it's my fault. It's not my fault. This COVID happened and then I lost my job and then I couldn't, you know, or whatever. I mean, those are valid reasons. Sorry, there were rubbish <laughs> reasons. I don't know. It's like, I don't know. The sky was blue and then I, I don't know. I had to end up buying this giant, giant tub of mayonnaise. And are it's you not talking my about fault. sitting in victimhood? Basically, but also, yes. But also what I'm talking about is, If I blame you for being a good parent and shame you for being a good parent, I don't have to look at my own shame. So Mm. I'm focused on your shame instead of mine. I'm I'm trying to create shame in you. This is what the narcissistic parent or partner or whoever there is in your life does all the time. They create shame in the people around them in order to avoid looking at their own. So they project and create this shame in children particularly so that the child won't ever start and look and go is this your shame or mine Mm. because if you're in a healthy relationship and someone's shame is triggered in any way shape or form you're going to be able to say that's not on me that's not on me at all that's on you whereas when you grow up in these environments you're taught that everything that goes wrong is your shame and that actually by being a better parent or a different parent you're deliberately shaming your narcissistic abusive parent. And that's, you know, the awareness again, we're talking about awareness in that too. He's trying to make her a less conscientious parent so he doesn't have to look at his own behavior, which is in turn the externalizing of his shame. Yeah. There's yeah. my TED talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, as you're saying that, I'm like, I am absolutely hearing that and hearing the gain for him because when he's criticizing her as a parent, what he's saying is, look at you. You love your child and you're fucking up and you're making mistakes. So don't have more empathy for me. Don't come to me if there's any problems with me. I'm, but again, he's not going to take any ownership in that as a healthy parent would go and yeah, it's difficult. Yes, we make mistakes. Yes, this is hard, but he's criticizing her again to avoid that accountability and responsibility and which just adds to her own confusion and then to the, I mean, the gaslighting. Absolutely. And I, so I think actually moving then on to the question because of this contradiction between is it possible to have some form of relationship without addressing the issues of the past and tolerating the present, knowing he doesn't have the same impact on me, now I'm independent. And then she goes on further to say, I would be grateful for your thoughts on if it's realistic to think that without addressing the past, is it possible to have an okay relationship in the present and the future? And what I'm going to just notice to you is that even if he does not address it, you can't continue denying it. You can't Mm. pretend it didn't happen. So every time you interact with him, all of that past is going to be right here, right now, because it's never been acknowledged. It's never been taken responsibility for. It continues to expose the paper cuts every time he does anything that's even slightly close like for example coming home six hours after you've given birth to before or coming home before Mm -hmm. you've even had a shower with your oldest not looking after him for long enough to give you some time to you know heal and recover that in itself is going to be a paper cut because it's a reflection and, and a repeat of every time he has not prioritized your needs and so every time he does that whether it's intentional or appropriate or not it's going to feel like it's every time it happened before Mm. so essentially what's going to happen is when one person doesn't address or take accountability and the other person you know you say you're you're independent now and it doesn't have the same impact on me but I hear a small child being sad Mm. I hear a very small child wanting their daddy to love them the way that they should have been loved and not getting it and And you say that you're not stuck in that hope that he will change. But I think there's hope that you can have a relationship and we can't tell you what to do. But I'm just hearing you constantly being rewounded, old wounds getting opened over and over again. And I don't know how someone can exist in that environment without it impacting them. That's that's pain constantly being inflicted on you. I completely agree, Helen, and I can just hear the amount of empathy and compassion uh, in your voice. So I, too, just want to second that. And 
when I'm sitting here then thinking for ways for this listener to validate herself or ways mm. that she invalidates it. I want to take you to two pieces in the letter where this listener says, I felt I, I want to just highlight. It's not that you felt like you were neglected and didn't mm -hmm. have parent figures. You were neglected and yeah. didn't have parent figures. And then what did that feel like? Yeah. So, for example, what that might sound like was I we were neglected and didn't have parent figures and I felt lonely, scared, abandoned. Right. Do you yeah. see how that hits differently than emotionally? There was another time again where this listener says, I look back at it now and feel like I was never a priority. No, you weren't a priority to your mm -hmm. father or your mother. And I want to come back to that now in one second. So you're saying that I look back at it now and I see that I was never a priority and I feel and there you expand on that. I feel sad for that child or I feel angry towards the parents. Mm -hmm. Right. So see the difference when and I see a lot of people that do this and I do this with my clients and I preface it with them saying, look, this might sound really pedantic when I'm going to highlight to you the difference of what you're saying between this happened or I think this and then I feel mm -hmm. we're very quick, I think, as a society when we're trying in a really healthy way to move towards emotional intelligence and be more emotionally intelligent that actually we use this word I feel all the time. And a lot of the times we use it is because, well, if I say I feel something, you can't deny that and say because I get to own my feelings. Right. And that is true. But we have to be aware and use that feeling word appropriately. So you were neglected and didn't have a parent figure. And again, as I'm saying that, see the way now we can no longer sit in denial, but how we can stay in denial a little better, try to soften that and say, well, I feel like this thing happened. So we're still showing that I'm unsure about it and there's still, still ambiguity. Mm -hmm. So recognizing that and connecting then to the emotions is, is huge. Um, you know, Katie, that thing of feel and think, I remember a supervisor pulling me up on it like mm. you're not you don't feel that Helen you think it own wow. it and what he said is when we use the word feel we distance ourselves from yes. our concrete thought yes right yeah and that actually and I do this with my clients too it's like and I don't apologize and I don't say it's a pedantic I say mm. that the, when you're saying I feel like this thing happened and that a little no you think that because what you're trying to do is soften the blow to yourself or the other person that you're talking to about it and that's not owning it and that's not processing it and that's not standing secure and sure mm -hmm. in your thoughts and what he said was when we are saying I feel we usually follow that with one word Mm. I feel sad, mm. I feel happy, I feel angry, I feel confused, I feel jubilant, I feel hateful, I feel depressed. Yeah, an emotion. I feel an emotion, is followed by an emotion. Right? Yeah. So when somebody says to me, I feel like blah, 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 and they go into a kind of spiel, I'm like, are we thinking or feeling? Because what we're doing there is actually intellectualizing that yes. we're dressing it up to look like feelings yes. which makes us think we're processing it but we're not we're intellectualizing which again mm -hmm. keeps us very separate very sort of stud back from the emotion of the situation which in turn means we're not healing it because my favorite phrase you've got to feel it to heal it you can't mm. you can't think your way through trauma it just doesn't work like that you can't put these like analyses and rationalizations and theories into what happened you have to reflect on how it made you feel in order to make it heal yeah absolutely and Helen before we finish I just want to go to this question the listener asked mm -hmm. I just want to slip away from my dad but without causing conflict or being the source of his complaining how can my past experiences be so ignored and invalid so there, we are encouraging you to validate your own experience, mm -hmm. to stop denying it, to separate that thought from feeling. But this idea, I just want to slip away from my dad without causing conflict or being the source of his complaining. Mm -hmm. When we're looking at this in terms of responsibility, right, the source of his heart, this is his to manage. 
This is yeah. his complaining. This is where a boundary is going to have to be held because you can slip away from your dad and not say anything to him. This is Helen's three questions, which I absolutely love when somebody is thinking of confronting uh, an abusive person in their life. And it's what will this cost me? What is the gain? And will anything change? And again, I really want to reiterate with that, that the gain can be huge for in somebody's healing. Well, I can feel empowered. This mm. is actually going to show me once and for all if the person cares or not, whether they're going to take accountability. But the cost can be, no, I'm actually going to fall out with X, Y, and Z. And that's too much for me to bear right now. So mm -hmm. I just want to gray rock, let's say. And that's 100% valid. And this is the only person that can answer this is you. But that idea, I want to slip away from my dad. You absolutely can. And this is mm -hmm. where are you going to put boundaries in when he starts complaining? When are you going to start treating him like the adult that he is? Whereas he has parentified you and you have always looked at him as a as the helpless child, even though all his behavior is showing on the contrary, because he is absolutely meeting his own needs mm. everywhere. But here you're going to have to recognize that his complaining as that tantruming child that isn't getting the sweets when they're up at the checkout counter in the supermarket, mm. that you get to complain. And just because you're complaining doesn't mean that I have to give in to you. And this is about coming out of that fear, obligation and guilt recognizing it, putting it down. And it will be uncomfortable if for somebody to wait till a stage that they're actually fully empowered to be able to do this. At the start, this will be uncomfortable. And that is where I encourage you to share this with your therapist to be able to work through this and to be able to, as Helen said, feel those emotions and to not intellectualize them. Absolutely. Absolutely. There is one more question. Mm -hmm. that I would like to address. It wasn't really a question, more of a statement, a query. And it was this. My granddad died recently, but when I last saw him, he told me that my dad was such a great granddad. Mm. It has stuck with me, and I wonder why he thinks that. And I'm going to answer this for you, and it might be a little bit brutal. But here it is. Your father, like he did to you, like he did to everyone else and like he does to everyone else by building the tree house, by doing X, Y, Z, convinced your grandfather that he was the best grandfather ever. And that is why it's so goddamn confusing. You have spent your whole life being told what a brilliant dad he is to you by both him and anyone else around you. But here when we sit with you and we see the things that he's done to you, we can tell you how bad this is and we want to validate it so much because what I really want you to notice is how well you see it, how accurately you can judge it, mm -hmm. how much you can trust your perception and therefore your feelings around it. It is atrocious how he has treated you. It's atrocious that he has convinced everyone that he's this amazing father and grandfather. But he is lying to himself and to you. The question now is, do you want to buy into the lie or do you want to leave it behind? Mm. Because you deserve peace. You deserve value. You deserve truth in your life, as do your children and your husband. So... Yeah. Helen, as you just said that, you just tapped right into the grief there uh, and I suppose exposed it and brought it to the surface. And the grief is not around the relationship that she has with her father. It's one, the relationship that she deserved or wished she had. But it's also the grief for the uh, for the younger her, right, right up to now. All that doubt, all that gaslighting, all that, you know, the inability to be able to trust yourself and therefore how much power you give away to everybody else in that scenario when you're not able to trust your own feelings and emotions. And if we're with a safe person, that can be okay because they can highlight back to you and you know you can be able to explore that. But how vulnerable you are to exploitation, how much you're giving that power away if there's an abuser there present. And that is what the grief is for, the grief for the younger self, the grief that you ever doubted yourself, the grief that you ever thought you deserve this or didn't deserve more from this. Yeah. That is the grief and that also is valid and in naming that naming that sadness that grief because grief is loss so the loss of all those years that is valid and yeah I just want to offer space for that 
Yeah, absolutely. And remembering as well, it's not just loss, it's not having things that you should have had to. Mm -hmm. And there's a huge grief in it. I mean, I would call that loss too. So maybe that's not me being being clear. No, I absolutely agree. Mm. But it's sometimes people focus on the what yes. they have had and then lost yes. rather than what they could have had and not. You're absolutely not right. No, that's had. really important to, to clear that up. There is a big misconception in the world that you can't grieve what you never had. Yes. And that is absolutely yes. not true. Mm. And this is exactly where we can see why that mm. is not true. You did not have security. You didn't have safety. You didn't have healthy development. You didn't get to sexually develop without his intrusion. You did not get to be a child. And there is so much grief and so much loss in the not having of those things that that deserves to be felt as much as any of the rest of it. Helen, that part where you said that we didn't get to grieve the thing we didn't have, there's been something sitting kind of unsaid, I think, through the whole letter. And you mentioned at the beginning in regards to the mother and in mm. terms of these emotions. And I don't know whether it's that this listener isn't given herself the permission to grieve the thing that she didn't have or to feel anger towards the mum in her eyes suddenly announced that she wanted a divorce. I'm definitely hearing a shrouding, a suppression of being willing to acknowledge that. And maybe this listener just didn't want to acknowledge that in this letter. Mm -hmm. Maybe they've worked on that and are working that on in therapy. I'm absolutely hearing the avoidance in this letter to go to something, which for me always um, is then very interesting when somebody doesn't want to talk about something mm -hmm. because it's showing how much something then needs to be talked about, what sort of emotions are lying under there. So again, I just want to invite you with your therapist to to bring that when you're ready or even bring, I'm not ready to talk about this thing yet, because mm -hmm. in that you're actually naming it. You know, I just think you're so right, Katie. And I felt like we were getting to the end. And actually, I just want to really quickly unpick mm. this. Because where is mum protecting her from this behaviour? Where is mum saying it's not okay? Where is the custody arrangement? Where is all this? Where is mum on is? the day you gave birth? Yeah. Why is dad looking after youngest? Now, I'm worried that maybe mum's um, not around anymore, as in she's passed away or something awful. But there is grief there somewhere too. There is, because even if that were true, and it could well be, Typically, we would see that written in the letter and my mum passed when I was whatever age and then it would mm. say and we we either had a did or we didn't have a close relationship. And look, again, this could be a letter and that could be just something that was um, accidentally left out. But it, again, I would question when something is kind of accidentally left out, actually, what emotions is around mm. there and where is that, you know, and where was that just done unconsciously? Yeah, I mean, in therapy, we say you don't quite often, don't we? There's no such thing as an accident. Yes. Like it's there's an intent to this, mm -hmm. not having mum in here. And I appreciate yeah. in your mind, maybe you would justify it as well. I wanted to focus on the relationship with my dad and that's valid. But also it's it's unusual not to have had anything other than yeah. mum left suddenly. And I think it's really important that we really highlight this to you as well. Mm -hmm. Um that the absence of her speaks volumes yes and if you were in therapy with me I'd be wanting to pull it apart and understand mm -hmm. that more um yeah you know and yeah so so again your grief is valid your pain is valid your feelings are valid your perception is good and it's a decision on what whether you want to stay with the lie or live with the truth you know it's it's a difficult oh, yeah. choice but yeah one that's worth making ultimately yeah Helen and we're just setting in huge compassion and, and leaving yeah. space for all those emotions absolutely and I think that brings us to the the end of the podcast I think you're probably right Katie mm -hmm. Kerr, which leads me to ask what is your win this week you know my win this week is actually my clients um facing those hard truths this is this is painful as fuck this is no mm. easy feat it is really difficult to do and really being honest with ourselves first um so yeah no this week absolutely um my win is my clients oh that's yeah. a good win I love the client wins because I oh. think it's 
They wear it so hard. And I think you and I obviously have tried those roads before mm-hmm. as well. And we know what it's like and we know how hard it is. So, yeah, I think it's really privileged, honoured to be able to watch my clients grow. And so mm-hmm. it's, it's an amazing thing. Yeah, it's it absolutely amazing. is. So straight back at you, Helen, what's your win? Oh, I called 999, didn't I, Katie? So that's it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what a win. That's it. Woo-hoo. Yeah. And I, and I will do it next time. The next time that happens, and, and sadly it will happen again, mm. that I will immediately call it rather than waiting <laughs> I was going to say hour. very inappropriately and say we look forward to it. <laughs> but obviously <laughs> I do not look forward to you, to you being in pain. Yeah, and that's just a huge win, being able to meet your own needs. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It is. Yeah. Okay. On that note, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Pinch of Nam and Boston Ale House, all the listeners, especially the Patreons. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, everyone, for all your support. And I guess all that remains to be said is take care. Bye. Bye.